Greg, we're recording. How are you, buddy? I'm all right. I'm all right. I've uh, had a few lazy days, and I've been researching the Bill of Rights 1688 in order to try and insert it as a couple paragraph summary um, into the European Withdrawal Agreement Act, European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020. Both of them are a disaster, and the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 is actually based on the Bill of Rights 1688. Right. With just as much confusion. Right. Yeah, you we talked about this a little bit earlier. So let's before we get into this, um, we haven't done a conversation. Let me bring you up the speed for a bit. We haven't talked about this publicly for about 10 days. But for those of you watching, we have been working on it a lot together. Um, Greg has told me that he's discovered some new stuff, which we're going to talk about tonight or today, depending where you're watching. Um, but it goes back to what you just spoke about, the 1688 Bill of Rights. So do you want to start then and, and explain that a bit more, Greg? Um, well, the Bill of Rights does exactly the opposite of what it purports to do once you find out what the meanings of the words are. And what, what the treaty writers have done and Bill of Rights writers and the judges and lawyers and MPs, they're all sellouts and they can't read documents. So they know that no one will be able to understand what they're writing. And they write in a really flowery, convoluted, ambiguous, painted ambiguous style. Yeah. And um, they'll define the words in one section, right? And then use it colloquially through the rest of the document. So people will read person in the colloquial term or people in the colloquial term, but what it actually says is assembled at Westminster lawfully, fully, and freely representing all the estates of the people. And thereafter, they just use the word people, but yeah. it's the estates of the people, so they're actually talking about everyone's land and buildings. Right? In the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, and they're not actually talking about the people. So when they give rights to the people, they're not giving rights to the people. They're mm. giving rights to the land and the buildings, and they're giving themselves the rights to the land and the buildings, not you. So when you buy a house, you don't actually own it. You just own the right to pretend to own it, and that's called fee simple. And that's been going on since 1688. 1688 was the first time the British people were absolutely stripped of all of their rights. But was that never returned to them over the years? No. 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 The only right they had was to bear arms if you were Protestant and able, which means you knew how to work a gun and could operate it and were and sane and had cause. And they've just stopped everyone having guns except for farmers. So oh, yeah. all of the all of the rights in the Bill of Rights were actually removed straight away, and they were then uh, removed again by the Act of Settlement. And during that time, we had four kings, which was James the First, Charles the First, Charles the Second, James the Second, and they pretty much all died of syphilis. Right, and they had things like 20 children with 15 dying due to the congenital syphilis they'd inherited. Um, and they had multiple partners and multiple illegitimate children and regularly they had one or no surviving illegitimate children. And at the same time, they changed the time. Um, in um, 1701 and 1752, they changed the time. Uh, so between about about 1582 and about and, and actually 1949, they changed time all across the planet at different stages. From the, so, the Greenwich Mean Time, you mean? Well, Greenwich. We didn't get Greenwich Mean Time until 1884. So was it still based on it coming out of um, London before that, though? Um, it swapped about four times between fr uh, Paris and London, Paris and London. Interesting. I didn't know that. I thought yeah. GMT was a uh, lot earlier than that. So, incidentally, 
with that in mind, there's something that I found always very strange is on a UK logbook, your V5, it says, even if you own the car 100%, it says on the paperwork, you are not the owner of this vehicle. You are the registered keeper. It might yeah. actually say you're not necessarily the owner. Actually, I've got one there. What I'll do is I'll slip away in a second and grab it and see what it says. But well, they, they are the owner. The DMV is, is the owner of the vehicle. That's what and I mean. And they can come and take it. it. And it's, it's the same. They're making it the same with land. They have made it the same with land. If you buy the land and you've got a fee simple agreement, um, which is standard, you are just the registered keeper and occupier of the land. Um, you don't own it. The Crown owns it. And the Parliament owns the Crown. The Parliament took over the Crown in 1688. And it's never really given it back. I mean, you, you told me 1688 was when William the Orange came, William of Orange came over, yeah? Yeah, but he has various names as well. He's called um, a lot of things. Um, and I'll just see if I can find it, actually. Um, He's called um, William. Uh, we we know him colloquially as William of Orange, but yeah. in the actual documents, he was known as um, his Higness. His without what? an H, not his his Higness, the Prince of Orange. Yeah, his Higness, H I G N E S S E. Right. So he wasn't actually known as His Highness, and he wasn't actually known, actually known as um, William the Prince of Orange. He was His Highness because they were taking away His um, Majesty, right? Yeah. And, his, and they, they spell Majesty uh, because there's 15 different times it's spelt. And it's M A J E S T I E S, which is how we spell it now. Four out of fifteen spellings, and then eleven out of fifteen spellings, it's um, M A G E S Y. I think it is Y E S. Oh, are you saying? So, so what, what I'm saying is that the document uh, of the Bill of Rights has been has been purposefully misspelled. Um, just a huge number of times, and unnecessarily so. Um, and they call the government, they call it Lord Spiritual with two L's and Temporal with two L's. Well, right? what's the point? Just to throw people off the case or just trying to wind him up or just trying to dispel just, his authority? It's flowery words so that people get lost in the flowery words, right? Um, uh, so there's just absolutely multiple spelling mistakes. There's multiple time dates because the Bill of Rights was actually passed in 1687, 1688, and 1689, which was all the same moment in time. Okay, so let's just... Because... Because... The year used to begin on the 25th of March. Uh-huh. Right? So this was first started on the 13th of February, 1687, which they took to be 1688, and it wasn't. It was 1687, because it was February. And then once the 25th of March came, they then did the rest of the documents in 1688, which was 1688. And then in 1752... They had um, a short year where they took off, they skipped 10 days from the 3rd to the 13th of September. So it went from the 2nd of September to the 14th of September and then started the Gregorian calendar, oh, actually on my birthday. Um, uh, and then um, they also had a short year, 282-day year, um, where they removed 1st of January to the 25th of March. So the 25th of March was all of a sudden called the 1st of January, and they had a short year. 
All right. And this, this, this happened in, in a dozen different countries over 400 years. So you can actually sail down from England to Portugal and it would be, let's say, a four-day sail, and you'd arrive there two weeks before you left. And then when you, when you left, it would take you a month to get back. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so there's all these poems about silly time. So what people did was they actually went by um, uh, maritime time, hence maritime, sea time. Yeah, because the dates were so stuffed up, like it was incredible. So we've only had a clear time when the whole planet has pretty much been on the same same date timeline, and you know corrected hours of day. Well, actually, not even that. So the same date has only been in place since 1949, right? All right. So you, you might think you might think that's strange, but the foot, right? The length of a foot, right? Which is yeah. like, you know, it's this big, right? But in in Scandinavia it was this big. Bigger right? people. Well, bigger people, bigger feet. Right? So the foot was only a universal uh, measurement from nineteen fifty nine. Right? So all this stuff that we've had, all this communication we've had without difficulty, without labouring, without disagreement, without um, contrary calculations has only been in place since 1949, 1959. Well, it seems like England's got the most complicated one because you've got yards, fathoms, furlongs, uh, and mi yeah. miles, you know? I mean, it's very complicated. And the money was just the same. Shillings, guineas, it was confusing. Shillings, pounds and pence, it was, it was incredibly difficult. And thruppence and yeah. crown. Half um, so, so what, what's happened is that all of this confusion that we used to have in things like currency and time and language um, was used in documents like the Bill of Rights to make things confusing, but it would sound poetic. Okay. Uh, so what, what happened was that they actually used words that were not... Uh, understood to be, you know, most people would be misunderstanding them. Um, okay. And on top of that, yeah, go ahead. Let, let me let me jump in there because look, I understand this, but I have to keep you on track so most people can understand it because you run away and, and then they end up having to watch this three times to try and understand it. So, <laughs> <laughs> which is all right, you know, it's difficult. I, I, have the, I have the luxury of being ask you privately, so I can do these videos and come across really intelligent and nod and smile, but then later call you up and say, listen, mate, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> what does no, that mean? <laughs> the, um, on the Bill of Rights, what I found very interesting there was this was the first time that the Crown conspired against the public of the United Kingdom or Britain or whatever you wanted to call it, and they did one great big pulling the wool over the rice trick and brought in a foreign king to rule England, took, stripped the rights of the people away, put the king on a basic salary as a puppet king. Am I right with this? Yeah, yeah. As yeah. a puppet king, and then the, the parliament just did whatever they want. They sold the UK out. They started putting terrible laws on them, stripped them of their wealth. And that's when they really started to get very wealthy. These large landowners were obviously all in on this entire thing when slavery would have started and the plantations in the Caribbean would have started and all this other slave labor. And then it goes into the re industrial revolution where these people still had all the power and still had, a, still had all the cheap labor. They started building these huge mansions in the middle of England. And this is how it continued this whole class system and it's never been rectified since this started in 1688. Now, would you say that's a, an accurate description? Oh, uh, yeah, you can have all the credit. You want to keep it simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's um, reasonably accurate. What actually happened was um, King Charles, King James I, King Charles I, King Charles II, King James II were absolute philanderers and they were 
going for absolute rights, so pretending not to be Catholic so they can get the crown, and then they actually were Catholics. And sometimes halfway through their kingship, they would change from being um, Protestant or Church of England to Catholic. Um, and sometimes they got the entire high Anglican ceremonies and turned them to Catholic. And, then, and high Anglican and Catholic is exactly the same, except for one says Queen and the other says Pope. Right, so yeah. high Anglican Catholic, almost identical. Um, and then they, one of the kings got um, all of the preachers around the country to preach high Anglican Catholicism right through and replace all the Anglican um, teachings, Presbyterian teachings, or Protestant teachings with, um, uh, with high Anglican and Catholic. Right, so that caused things like bishops' wars Bishops' um, Wars. Yeah, the Bishops' Wars um, went on. They're pretty pissy, really. The, the English Civil Wars and, and, uh, and um, Bishops' Wars were really just a bunch of villagers going to another villages and hitting them over the head with a small wine barrel and stealing some vegetables. And occasionally someone gets shot, but it's usually an accident. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's usually friendly fire and it's usually duck shot. Um, yeah, so um, uh, it's, just, it's just absolute fakery when you read it. It's just it's, it's atrocious. Sort of fake. It's, it's, and, and basically it's an oath that's not, a, not an oath. Um, I'll see if I can read you a bit. Um, well, one of, one, of the, one of the main things is it, it, it's cognitive dissonance. It's so bad that you can't actually believe what you're reading. It says stuff like, the citizens can petition the king, but all of the king's decisions and concerns are illegal and have no basis and have no standing. So anything the king or queen says to the parliament and requests of them, the government, the parliament does not have to act on, does not have to listen to, and can do the exact opposite if it wants. Now, I've been saying for quite a while that Queen Elizabeth II's uh, birthday speech and Christmas speech is totally ambiguous. And the reason it's ambiguous is because Parliament pays her salary, she can't tell them what to do, and they don't have to listen to her, and anything she says, no one has to take any legal notice of. She never and really that's said anything that's, that's forceful, though. She's just saying, we've had a terrible year, and I hope it's going to be better, and thank you very much, and that's about it, really. Uh, she says stuff like, um, I'd like to see more development of the train tracks and I'd like to see um, more development for young people's jobs and more work schemes in this area and the mid-north and stuff like that. Um, but basically it doesn't get carried out. And then they, they talk about Queen Mary as Queen Mary So, like S-O-E on the end with a capital S. Right. So, <laughs> King William and Queen Mary, so help me God. Right now, so is usually S O, and it's usually a lowercase S. But with her, they give it a capital S, and 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 they add an E, and then help has got an E on it as well. And um, yeah, so. What happens is you get you look at all of these documents, all of these lines, and they've got huge numbers of spelling mistakes. And part of the flowery language of law is to try and go back to ye old English. Yeah. Right. But we're talking 1688, and and sort of um, it's 70 years after Shakespeare, so the ye old language is is out, but they're still using it for the purposes of patent ambiguity. Yeah, but do you think there's anything hidden in all of that? Like spelling so S-O-E with a capital S and adding an E. Yeah, yeah, when you look at it, what they're saying is that um, 
King William and Queen Mary were descendants of um, King Charles and King James II, I think it is. Um, and they were like first or second cousins. Um, the whole operation was a sellout operation where the, the Jewish bankers in Holland recognised that the whole kingship of Britain had been illegal since James I in 1603, and it was just being run to the ground. They were basically, the kings, James and Charles, were Catholic double agents setting about destroying England and giving it away to Holland, giving it away to Germany, and giving it away to bankers. So um, what they did is they named them as Dutch agents by misspelling their names, like calling him His Higness, um, the Prince of Orange, yeah, and not calling him William, and then Queen Mary So, S-O-E, on the end of it with a capital S. Um, and that, that's, that's patent, patent ambiguity. It's patent ambiguity. And patent ambiguity falls against the Crown. And the actual agreement of the Bill of Rights that um, William of Orange, his hedonist William of Orange and Queen Mary, Princess Mary became Queen Mary, um, the, the agreement they created with the Bill of Rights was that all British people would be stripped of common law. Yeah. And they would have no common law rights. They would not own any of their land. They would not know, own any of their buildings. And they would not be able to petition the monarch. And they would be allowed to petition Parliament on a regular basis, regular being weekly or fortnightly. But all Parliament did was close its doors so that no one could go into Parliament and petition a politician. I mean, you try and get something heard in Parliament. No, it's it, it, I, actually, I have been in there. I've got a friend of mine who works there. I've been right into the green room, but I understand what you mean. It's impossible because they just lock themselves away so you can't actually have any access to them. So, you know, it's like trying to serve some of the paper. They don't take it. It's not valid. So, all right, Greg. So the, other th the other thing it says, it's got subjects, right? Yeah. So it's got subjects. And people are subjects. That's the new status. Um, so the, the subjects and the citizens, um, but um, they just, uh, and they can't petition the king, the king's got no rights, they can petition the king, but it's got no validity. They can petition the parliament, and it has got validity, but they can't actually access the parliament. So there's nowhere that they can have their grievances heard. They've just lost all their common law rights, so they can't go to court and all the common laws have been repealed and uh, are replaced with statutes, civil statutes, which are all written up in, in a legal manner. So that means that from 1688, everyone in the United Kingdom was stripped of their living man, living woman, living child, common law rights. And we haven't had any rights since 1688. The Jewish bankers got um, put William and Mary in from Holland into England and said, okay, you're the king and queen now, but you're only the colour of law style king and queen and the actual crown, the real style and titles of the crown go to parliament and the real uh, and the colour of law titles goes to parliament and the king and queen only get the colour of law style of the crown, which is the most useless quarter of it, right? So um, that meant that all the kings and queens were doing from 1688 was carrying a handbag and being painted or photographed. So, all right, did you know this before we started on this European Agreement Act? Well, actually, I sort of I looked up... Um, I was researching. I go, oh, okay, I want to find out. I want to find out some stuff on um, the King James's and King Charles's, right? And I thought, oh, hang on a moment. I think I wrote a book on it. <laughs> I looked up. 
I looked up um, how to take over the world, a right rule con that I'd written in 2007. So it was one of your books. And it's got a whole chapter on it. It's about 30 pages and it's, it's really good. There's things now, you know, the stuff on Charles and, um, and, and James is, is better than, than I've got now. So I'm, I'm using that in there. Um, but the stuff that I found out about the Bill of Rights here and now, looking at a more original document, is so much more damning. And I, I was, had help from a, um, a Masters of History can't be right Yeah. Right the chapter. So, you know, he, he got a whole lot of research down to short. Um, yes. So, um, what, what, what the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 has done is it's used the Bill of Rights as a model, which is patent ambiguity, use difficult words, use referencing to things that people don't know, like... <clears throat> Uh, a variant reading of the text noted in the statutes of the realm as follows, and O, square brackets, O refers to a collection in the library of Trinity College, Cambridge, in brackets. So, so, so what you got, you got this document, and then it's got O, and then it says variant reading, and you actually have to go to the Trinity College, Cambridge, and find some librarian who's going to look it up and tell you what O means. And O could be 100 pages. And O can refer to another 100 pages in another library. So who wrote this, Greg? Who wrote this actual agreement now? Is there the, any the name Jewish, on it? Jewish bankers actually wrote the Bill of Rights so that the Jewish bankers would put their agents, William and Mary, on the throne of England, who would be the colour of law style king and queen, and then the, the actual three quarters of the crown, the, the, the real style and titles and the colour of all titles would go to the parliament. Yeah. The parliament would fund the king and queen so the king and queen couldn't say anything. People would go and be heard by the king and queen, but what they said didn't make any difference. And then the Jewish bankers would run the parliament. And so parliament now the same, crown. They're trying to do the same but, thing again. I oh know, I'm trying to do it again. So parliament owned the crown. And so the Jewish bankers owned Parliament, Parliament owned the Crown. The Crown was just um, uh, patsy proxies. Um, and, uh, yeah, so anyway, the whole thing was amended. Um, Queen Elizabeth II decided to um, add a line to it and amend it. Yeah. Um, uh, and she did that in 2014. And she said... And the said crown and government shall from time to time descend to and be enjoyed by such person or persons being Protestants as should have inherited and enjoyed the same. She, she wrote, wrote that. She, she added that in 2014. And what it means is she's acknowledging me as the King of England, King of Scotland, King of Britain, King of Great Britain, King of the United Kingdom, Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And then she backdated it to the 25th of April, 2013, which was the same day I was promoted, elevated above her. So I was actually registered in the Holy See as a member of the Jesus Mary lineage, which makes me above Elizabeth. So she saw that in 2013, and then she wrote the laws of succession and also changed the Bill of Rights Act in 1688. The laws of succession allow me to become king and the Bill of Rights Act allows me here in this line, this one line, and the said crown and government shall from time to time descend to and be enjoyed by such personal persons being Protestants as should have inherited and enjoyed the same. So okay. what they're saying is if someone discovers that they were king before the, sh the rubbish kings came in in 1603, yeah. that if they had royal lineage, they can claim it. And I'm saying I'm descended from... Queen Anne Boleyn, her grandson was Sir Walter Raleigh. He found the Book of Predictions and he's actually got the title Christ, Sir Walter Raleigh Christ. Christ is automatically the King of England. I'm descended from Sir Walter Raleigh. I discovered this whole thing, published it, um, sent a letter to Elizabeth asking for a meeting, and then she responded with the change to the Bill of Rights Act 1688 and the um, Laws of Succession change in 2014 
which were both backdated to the 25th of April 2013 when I was elevated above her, and this is how she acknowledges it. All right, so there's two points in there. We'll <laughs> move on to the next point that I want to address. <laughs> the first thing is that surely must be good news because that, that gets rid of all the power of this Agreement Act, yeah? If you, once you get in there um, and establish that, we still have to do this, though. Well, I've already, I've already done that and dismembered the um, European Union Agreement Act 2020. Um, and, you know, I've just I've done it verbally and I've just got to do it. I've done it on paper here, but I've just got to tidy up the paperwork. Um, <clears throat> and what I said in that interview was that there was no lawyer or judge or MP um, or Lord in the United Kingdom that could read a legal document or a treaty, and they can't. Yeah. They absolutely can't. And back in 1688, none of the members of parliament or lords or lawyers or solicitors or judges could read a document then either. And all of these documents have been written by um, Jewish bankers who are using pedophilia to keep all the lawyers, judges, members of parliament and lords stuck and silent yeah. and blackmail. Yeah. And like, you know, I wrote three books, three volumes, A4, about 1,500 pages, 1,600, 1,700 pages called uh, The World Is Run On Shame. The Sex Collectors, The World Is Run On Shame. And all that people in power actually do is collect sexual material on people. And then they run the world. That's all they do. And <clears throat> they get pedophiles and they go, oh, you're a pedophile. That's great. Here's a little child. We'll form you and then we'll make you a member of parliament or a mayor or a lord or a judge, whatever. And that's what's been happening. And it's been happening since 1688. And they're taking over entire countries, right? Well, and it appears to be that, that Britain gets taken over utterly, totally and completely every 300 years. But I would say more like about every 50 years, you know, just totally. Yeah. So there is no, and what, what amazes me is why is it still Britain and how is it still Britain? And it's because the inertia of the country is that the people are the same and they still like hedgerows and roundabouts and thatch cottages and <laughs> countryside and horses and dogs. And but apart from that, what's happening in the background with all these treaties is um, you, you could call yourself Africa. You could call yourself the moon. You could call yourself any country in the world because there's, there's almost no connection to pre-1688 Britain. Nothing, you know? All right, great. It's Let's terrible. Go. We've just been sold out massively, utterly and totally sold out every way. The second question I had on that one was... If the Queen was so bad and was trying to stop you, why would she put that clause in there? What's the emotion behind that action, you think? Um, the whole world's run by um, really high occult, and the really high occult observes all of the predictions that come from the various books, like um, the Book of Predictions, the Tradition Received, Rosicrucian Cosmography, the Bible, um, some ancient markings, secret poetry and phrases. Uh, a lot of that's in the tradition received. Um, four lines of writing by every pope since the first pope. They all get a chance to add four lines into it. So you talk, you've talked about this book of predictions before. What language is that written in, by the way? What do you Don't think? Know. Don't know. Don't know. Really? See, I, might, I might actually be... <clears throat> Walter Raleigh, he, he spoke and wrote six languages. And it might actually be that you have to speak and write in six languages in order to understand the document. Yeah, you have said that before, actually. Um, and then some of them, some of the documents I know are in English. And when you go and view them, you have an elite army brings the documents in and then occupies the rooms either side and allows you to go in, no cameras and you're allowed to take a few notes and you 
go go for an hour. Basically, you have to read as much as you can in an hour and memorize as much as you can. Mm, that's an interesting afternoon, isn't it? Well, yeah, yes, yeah. I know someone who's had that privilege. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's expensive. So someone says, well, "Why can't you show us the?" You know, that's that's the tradition of see. Why can't you show us the book of predictions? Um, well, you need armies, helicopters, castles, um, secret location. You know, <laughs> a, a cover operation. Sounds distraction. Like I'd be you know, on that. It's, yeah, it's like <laughs> we need sort of a hundred of you boys there, fully armed. I've, no. I, I've I've tried to fly a helicopter once. It's it's okay at high speed, but at low speed it's super sensitive. You can flip at any moment. It's very difficult. <laughs> fly right. an airplane, okay. but I can't fly a helicopter. So, Greg, um, so okay, we've established the history of where they've got this draft from, the Bill of Rights, sixteen eighty eight. Um, you said something to me earlier about a basketball court. I think this is quite a good thing to talk about to explain how complicated this is. Yeah, okay. So if you um, get the um, European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020, which is 99 pages, there's only 10 pages that you actually need to look at. But that refers to all of the other documents that have been emerging since 1957. Um, and 1957 document has been all but repealed, but then there's one line in there, which is the definition which you need, right? So if you've got all of the documents, if you've got a bicycle court right down to the, to the bleachers, right? And then you line that with a two and a half meter wall all the way around. Yeah. And then you got all the documents and pinned it around there. And then you got a string from one of the documents that's referring to the other document, right? And then that document then refers to that document to get a definition of what the day before means, right? So you got to look at four documents to find what the day before means. Um, and, and basically, the day before means it refers to the 31st of December. So the day before, you think it's the 30th of December, but it's actually the 17th to the 30th of December. Um, and then, so if you if you did got string between everything that referred to another thing, and then tried to walk from one end of the basketball court to the other end of the basketball court without touching a string, you couldn't do it. Shit, it's that complex. Right? This, 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 it's this, hugely think. complex. So when you say, "Why don't you just do this? Do this?" You know, um, I've got InDesign, right? So I've got two page set up on my screen there and I've got a page either side that I can see as well. So what I do is I, I read the document and then um, I copy bits over and I get a shortened version of each page, yeah? Da -da 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 -da. So I can, I've got like a summary thing. And then I also get what that, in the central page, what it refers to in the other document and then try and grab that. And so I've got four pages of text side by side and even in the shortened forms, I don't have enough side space to get to the definition of what they're talking about on one page. I need another two screens either side to look at horizontally what they're saying. Otherwise, I'm looking at it like that. Yeah. No, but down. It's just too complex. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And it's the same with pinning it up. Like, um, the, the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act 2020 is in no way a simple, it's, it's never been finished, it's never been laid out in a simple term because you could actually write the whole thing out in two pages. And if you did that and define all of the words, it would actually say um, the European Union is a private corporation. We are stealing all aspects of the United Kingdom. We're stealing every government department. We're extilling every newborn. Um, the British people have no rights. We can do with them what they like. We can use their army. We can use their people. We can steal their people. We can kidnap people. We can take any asset they want. we want. Um, you don't own your house. Um, you don't own your car. Um, we own all of your bank accounts. You have absolutely no rights. You are slaves. If we want you to be slaves, 
You're a tourist location if we want you to be a tourist location. You are an immigration dumping ground if we want you to be an immigration oh. dumping, dumping ground. And you have no choice over your education. Shit, man. I mean, it's, it's just, it, you told me it was bad, and we talked about this before off camera. But when you say it again, you know what I mean? Immigration dumping ground, do with it what you like. Um, close all your bank accounts, clean them out. You've got no property rights. I mean, it's just, but who orchestrated this, Greg? Who, where did this come from? Well, the, the, the European Union is a private corporation. So again, it's the Jewish bankers. Right. Because the, so, the Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews, absolutely do not care about the goyim at all. They call the goyim, us, white people, they call us cattle. Goyim means cattle. Yeah. So for them, we're cattle to be farmed. And they are always looking for new ways to farm us. And about every, whatever, 70 years, 200 years, 500 years, they find a new way to farm us and for them to get more and more control until um, we um, resort to spirituality in the inner worlds and the non-material worlds to have a life. Okay, hang on, hang on. Now, the, the thing about this... This could be considered to be anti-Semitic. So, I mean, the state... Oh, no, 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 it's not, not at all, not at all. Right, so um, it's just written down in that because I don't want any flack yeah. coming back about this, so tell us about that. Okay, so it's not, it's not um, anti-Semitic at all, anti-Semitic, because the, Frank, the, the Sabbatean Frankists actually said that they wanted to destroy Europe, which at the moment includes the United Kingdom, um, before the mash, in order to bring about the mash act, the Messiah. They actually said are, that. But, right? but that's you. Yeah, I know. I know. Um, and they, um, um, the Catholic Church um, acknowledged the Ashkenazis as the official Jews in 1509. And uh, apologies to previous interviews, I've said I said it was in the 1570s before but it's 1509, that the Ashkenazis, who weren't Jews, were acknowledged as the official Jews by the Catholic Church in 1509. And they're the Jewish bankers, but they're Ashkenazi bankers, and they're not Jews. So they can't claim to be anti-Semitic. And Semitic also means Arabic. So anti-Semitic actually means anti-Arab, right? And... The, the Jews, the real Jews, like the Hebrews and the Abrahamic Jews, they aren't even acknowledged by the Ashkenazis. They're shunned by the Ashkenazis, who are the 1509 Jews. So that's a problem. So you can't be anti-Semitic. It's, it's almost impossible to be anti-Semitic. All right, so how does all this come in? <laughs> Okay, let's let's go then. Let's go. This is an interesting conversation tonight. It keeps you always do this. You veer off. Um, so you're saying it's controlled by this Jewish banking contingent, but you're yeah. the what? How do you say that word again? The not the Messiah. It's Messiah. The Jewish uh, Messiah. Messiah. Well, so, yeah. Meshach. Have you not got power over these people? Yeah. But how do you wield that power now? Everything is being played out according to prophecy. Okay. I mean, fantastically so. Okay, so they go, what's the definition of a prophet? Uh, the definition of a prophet is someone who is shunned by his own country and shunned by his own family. <laughs> that sounds familiar. <laughs> right? So I've just had two uh, blisters, two ugly sisters, um, attacking me, being interviewed and attacking me. Um, and I haven't seen them since, what, 1975 and 93. And I've never had anything to do with them. Uh, and they're showing photos of people that aren't me and saying it's me. And they're doing projection. They're saying, I've done stuff and it's them. It's their qualities. It's not mine. You know? So um, uh, that's actually an acknowledgement of a prophet if you get attacked by family. And I've been attacked by my family in the media more than anyone else in the history of the world ever. Yeah. Well, right? you've got a few controversial things to say. 
<laughs> yeah, but no one else, no one else, brothers and sisters have gone out and said to any public figure, this guy is whatever, blah, 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 you know? Um, so that's part of the prophecy, right? Is that you, if, you, if you're part of the prophecy, you're going to be a prophet, right? Same root words. And then the definition of prophet is not accepted by his own country, not accepted by his own family. So that's set in stone. So all these, you know, what is it? The um, slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. <laughs> So basically, you know, you get shot, you're in a slingshot, right? You get shot to fame, and then there's all these um, people with arrows just pull, 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 you know, trying to shoot you down. He never paid his car bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder that some guy, and that, that actually wrecked of New Zealand internal affairs because the guy didn't name himself. He said Grosvenor House, and I've never been to Grosvenor House. He didn't say what year it was. Uh, and he gave no indication that we'd ever met. Yeah, no, let, me just, let me just tell the viewers what happened. So <laughs> when we were leaving England, we had a, somebody sent us a random message. I was driving with Lee, and we were driving to the airport. We're, we're thinking about, okay, we've got to get all this material out through Budapest, pretend to be tourists. And he said, hey, look, he said, look at this. He said, someone's just sent us a message saying, they were drinking with Greg in Grosvenor House Hotel, London. And he drank all night long and then left without paying the bar bill. And then Lee says, what a legend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you've never yeah, been well, to that hotel, have you? I haven't been to it. I looked it up on Google Earth and there's like three or four of them. I haven't been to any of them. So, um, you know, if that guy um, wants to contact me. I think um, it was a woman, actually, if I remember. Really? But I don't... Great, we get, we get literally hundreds of messages and yeah. every day. And yeah. most of them are very supportive and they're very nice, but then you, you occasionally get the crackpot ones. And, yeah, um, okay, I think I, think, well, I think I know what... The, the only way I can think of it is there's a pub, a group of us were meeting at, right? And there's a whole lot of new people meeting. And one of them was the um, kind of fiancé of... Um, the second commander of Operation James Bond, the, the fiance of the son. Yeah? And then so she's kind of part of the family, but she was a bit schizo. And um, she ended up not marrying the guy, right? And she was hitting on the guys in the bar, and then she got into a taxi and left the door open right in front of me, and I didn't get into the taxi with her, right? And then some reporter guy jumped in and we just waved him off. So I think she's having a bitch of me for not getting into the taxi with her. <laughs> <laughs>